a second. The title of this video is Liquid Private Equity. Isn't that an oxymoron? By definition, private equity is equity ownership in a private, not public company. And to invest in equity in a private company, you need to find a company available for investment, conduct due diligence, and negotiate a deal. And then to sell equity in a private company, you need to find a buyer that is willing to pay a price that you want and go through the entire sales process. So private equity doesn't sound liquid at all. Now, what about a private equity fund where a private equity firm buys private companies for you? Would that be liquid? The quick answer is no. The companies are still private. And usually private equity firms set up a private equity fund to have a 10 year term. We have many past YouTube videos on the details of a traditional private equity fund, but let me try to summarize these details quickly here. A traditional private equity fund is 10 years in length and is in the form of a limited partnership where the investors are the limited partners, the LPs, and the private equity firm is the general partner, the GP. This forms the private equity fund. Now, limited partners commit capital to the private equity fund. This commitment does not allow limited partners to invest all of the capital up front. After all, the GP still needs to find companies available for investment, conduct due diligence on these companies, and negotiate deals to buy these companies. That takes time. So when the limited partners commit capital to the private equity fund, only a fraction of this commitment, usually 20 to 30%, will be called. The rest of the capital is uncalled, and the limited partners have to figure out what to do with it. Now, over time, the general partner will buy companies in the private equity fund. As the general partner buys these companies, the general partner will call more capital from the investor. After the general partner buys companies, it will create value in these companies, or try to at least, and eventually will sell these companies. And at that time, capital is returned to the investor. The investor usually doesn't get all of the capital back until the end of the term of the fund. This doesn't sound liquid at all. Now, because of the illiquidity issues of private equity funds, a robust secondary market has evolved. Now, while limited partners can buy and sell in the secondary market, which is more liquid than investing in a 10-year private equity fund, which is commonly referred to as a primary fund investment, limited partners still need to find a buyer for a private equity secondary and negotiate a deal for the secondary. This is also not liquid. There are a lot more details that go into secondaries. I won't talk about them here, but if you're interested in learning more, please check out our video titled Private Equity Secondaries. Okay, so the title of this video is Liquid Private Equity, but it doesn't sound like private equity is liquid. So what gives? Well, let me explain. Traditionally, large investors such as pensions, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, foundations, and family offices have invested in private equity. These investors usually have a good understanding of the private equity fund structure, and these investors can deal with the illiquidity of the private markets, the minimum investment requirements needed to gain access to a private equity fund, and these investors can avoid vintage risk, the inability to diversify across vintages. The vintage year is the year that the private equity fund starts and investors usually need to invest in multiple funds to diversify across vintages. Now, many of the world's individual investors have a desire to invest in private equity, but they have issues with the illiquidity, minimum investment requirements, and with vintage risk. So, if there is a large demand for liquid private equity options, with lower minimum investment requirements and diversified vintages, what do you think 
the industry has created. That's right, liquid private equity options. In this video, we will talk about three liquid private equity options. We will talk about third-party evergreen funds. Then we will go over first-party open-ended funds. Then we will talk about the private wealth channel. And we'll end the video with a final thought. So let's get started with third-party evergreen funds. When I say third-party, I'm referring to companies such as Harborvest, Northleaf, Hamilton Lane, and Partners Group that have large businesses to invest in many other private equity firms through primary private equity fund investments and secondary private equity fund investments. Many of these firms also offer direct co-investments and some even offer their own direct funds, which would technically make them first party funds. But I'm trying to differentiate these evergreen funds from the first party open-ended funds that I will be talking about later in this video. When I say evergreen funds, I'm referring to funds that do not have an end date, such as the traditional 10-year private equity fund. The evergreen funds offered by these players usually have the following characteristics. They are invested in a mix of methods, mostly secondaries and direct co-investments, but they may also have some primaries as well. They are invested in a mix of stages, such as venture capital, growth, and bio. And they're invested in a mix of geographies, such as North America, Europe, and Asia. Now, these evergreen funds are targeted at individual investors because they have a low minimum investment requirement, and most importantly, they offer liquidity. Well, I'd call it semi-liquidity. Let me explain. These evergreen funds have an initial lockup period, usually three years in length, and after the three years, investors are free to sell their investment usually on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on the fund. Or in other words, there are monthly or quarterly redemptions. Also, investors don't have to wait for a new fund to be raised. Usually, investors can invest on a monthly basis. Or in other words, there are monthly subscriptions. Now, to help achieve liquidity, since the underlying companies are still private, the funds usually keep a little extra cash on hand and have lines of credit to ensure there is enough cash available for redemptions. And the evergreen funds protect themselves from too many redemptions by putting limits on the redemption amount, known as redemption gates, such as 5% of net asset value per quarter. While evergreen funds don't offer full liquidity, they are semi-liquid. And because of the low investment requirement, the minimum investment requirement, sometimes, which is as low as $25,000. This can be a great option for individual investors. Now let's move on to first party open-ended funds. When I say first party, I'm referring to firms such as KKR and EQT. When I say first party open-ended funds, I'm referring to the vehicles that these firms have created to target individual investors using the firm's own funds and direct co-investments, not primary and secondary fund investments from other private equity firms. For example, KKR has a product called K-Prime and EQT has a product called EQT Nexus. With the exception of the underlying investments being the private equity firm's own funds, these offerings are fairly similar to the third-party evergreen funds that we spoke about earlier, where there is a mix of stages, geographies, and sectors, and sometimes even other asset classes such as infrastructure. Also, these vehicles have similar lockup periods, usually three years, a low minimum investment requirement, and 
offer liquidity, usually after three years, but for a fee, it could be earlier. When I say liquidity, I mean that it's a semi-liquid vehicle that has frequent subscriptions, usually monthly, frequent redemptions, usually quarterly, redemption gates, in other words, a maximum withdrawal amount during the redemption, usually something like 5% of net asset value every quarter. And these fees also have liquidity management where they keep a little extra cash on hand and a credit facility available to help manage liquidity. Both the third-party evergreen funds and first-party open-ended funds may be a good option for individual investors to invest in because of the low minimum investment requirement, the ability to diversify, and the semi-liquid nature of these vehicles. So let's move on to the private wealth channel. Many individual investors already work with a wealth manager. And for years, wealth managers have tried to find solutions to give their clients access to private equity, such as by creating a pooled fund that invests in private equity funds, grouping some of their clients' capital together to gain access to specific private equity funds that have high minimums, and seeking out direct private equity deals as a value-added service for their clients. Well, there are many providers that have been trying to make it easier for the private wealth channel to access private equity. Some offer feeder funds, and some are technology platforms. An example of a firm that offers feeder funds is Moonfair. Through Moonfair, you can invest in firms such as Premira with a lot lower minimum commitment than you would usually have to invest if you invested in Premira directly. Fun fact, in 2015, KKR had a feeder fund called Cygnus that it used to access individual investors in the Canadian market. Cygnus no longer exists, but we'll save that story for another day. In terms of technology platforms, there is one firm that's making a big splash with RIAs, Registered Investment Advisors, in the US. And that firm is Opto. Opto's vice chairman, Mark Machen, was the president and CEO at CPP Investments, the largest private equity investor in the world. Mark, along with the Opto team, have raised $145 million in a Series A fundraise and have built a technology platform that allows RIAs to offer multiple private markets funds to their clients, funds that Opto's team has vetted. One interesting feature of Opto's platform is that it can allow RIAs to build a portfolio of private market funds, which it can then white label as a solution for their clients. Now, here's a final thought. We have talked about many options for individual investors to invest in private equity. But there's one thing not to forget. The investor's overall return will most likely be less than the IRR quoted from a traditional private equity fund. Investors, as you know from our video titled Issues with Committed Capital and Private Equity, in a traditional private equity fund, your actual return in private equity is less than the IRR quoted by the private equity fund because your uncalled capital will most likely not be growing at the same rate as IRR. These liquid private equity vehicles remove the issue of committed capital for you. But by definition, the underlying investments are still private and the issues still exist since there will be an element of cash drag on the portfolio. With that said, many of these vehicles do a good job at managing the cash drag, but nothing is for free and there are additional costs to administer this. Investors, liquid private equity options may be a good fit for you. They have low minimum investment requirements, they offer diversity across sectors, stages, geographies, asset classes, and vintages, and they offer liquidity. Well, I'd say semi-liquidity. But if you are gonna invest in liquid private equity, make sure to do your due diligence.